Hi, Russ of Aquarimax here. In today's installment of the Isopod Care Guide series, I'm talking about short-term and long-term maintenance of an isopod colony. Isopods are really fairly low-maintenance creatures, and that's part of the appeal of keeping them. When properly kept, they can be left alone for several days or more in most situations without any problems. However, there are certain tasks that need to be done fairly frequently in most isopod enclosures. One of the most important of these is ensuring that the isopods have access to a moisture gradient. That is to say, they've got a damp area and then a drier area in the enclosure so that they can self-regulate their moisture needs. As I mentioned in the video on setting up an isopod enclosure, a very easy way to do this is to provide a hydration station of damp sphagnum moss. You should ensure that this moss is always a little damp. The frequency with which you will need to moisten this moss by trickling a little water down the side of the enclosure so that it goes into the moss will vary quite a bit based on the enclosure and the surrounding area in your home. So things like ambient temperature and humidity, airflow, and ventilation in the enclosure will all play a part in this. In my particular situation, I like to check the moss at least once a week, and if it's starting to get close to drying out, I add a little water. Adding too much water can saturate the base substrate, and it's important to avoid that as well. Another very important task is monitoring the availability and the state of supplemental food, such as fish food pellets, bits of fruits and vegetables, or prepared isopod food mixes. I like to add these types of foods about two or three times a week, but it's also important to ensure that these kinds of things don't sit around and mold. It's better to offer a small amount of food and find it gone the next day than to offer too much and find that it's moldy the next day. The amount of food that you add to each enclosure will vary widely based upon the isopod population, the species of isopod, and even the type of food that you offer. Just make sure to leave the food either between the dry and moist areas or on the drier side. Definitely don't place it in the moss and put it in a place where you can see it easily and it's not in direct contact with the base substrate. That way you can check on the food without disturbing the isopods too much and anything moldy can quickly be observed and removed. While on the topic of isopod foods and feeding, I should mention that well-populated isopod cultures, especially of species with a hearty appetite, may need to be topped off with leaf litter as frequently as every week or two while a new culture may not need new leaf litter for several months. Calcium supplements such as cuttlebone or ground eggshell can also be replenished as they are eaten. When you're feeding or checking the moss patch for proper moisture levels, it's also a good idea to take a look at the general conditions within the enclosure. Are there any leaves or sticks or leaf stems leaning up against the side of the enclosure, providing an escape ladder of sorts for your isopods? Incidentally, another way isopods can climb up the sides of the enclosure if, is if there's a thin film of substrate or even just condensation that build up on the wall of the enclosure. So look out for that as well. And while you're looking, do you see any patches of fungal growth, bacterial growth? Are all the isopods huddled to one side of the enclosure completely avoiding the other? If so, one side might be too wet or too dry. And do you see any dead isopods? If you just see one or two, it may have died from natural causes. But if you see dead isopods in any numbers, you should start asking yourself some questions to start to pinpoint the cause. Are ventilation, moisture gradient, and temperature appropriate? Has anything about the enclosure or the surrounding environment changed recently? For example, have any chemicals been used in the house? Isopods can be very sensitive to pesticides, as well as chemicals used for cleaning. So those are the basics of short-term maintenance. Before I go into long-term maintenance, I'd like to thank my patrons at Patreon. I really appreciate all that you do. I love sharing my passion for the amazing animals of this planet, and you help make that possible. So if you want to find out more, please click the link at the end of the video. And now back to isopod maintenance. Long-term maintenance of an isopod enclosure is, at least in one way, more difficult than short-term care tasks, but some aspects are quite easy. For example, when you notice that the isopods have chewed down a piece of decor significantly enough that it's not really much of a hide anymore, it's a simple matter to just add a new piece. 
when you lift a piece of bark or other decor and it's wall-to-wall -wall isopods underneath, you may want to consider upgrading the size of your enclosure, or at least adding more hides. In my opinion, the most difficult aspect of isopod maintenance by far is changing the substrate while retaining every last isopod. Before we get into that, we need to discuss how often the substrate needs to be changed. Because there's really no set time limit that's applicable to every situation, as the species and the population size of the isopods, size of the enclosure itself, depth and composition of the substrate, and the frequency with which you add leaf litter to the enclosure are all contributing factors. One thing I try to pay attention to is the composition of the base substrate. I'm assuming that you're topping off leaf litter in the enclosure as needed. So if the base substrate under the leaf litter still has a lot of recognizable bits of leaves and wood and so on in it, this is an indication that it probably still has a good amount of life left in it. On the other hand, if it's composed almost entirely of isopod frass, which is the solid waste isopods produce, then it's probably time to change it. I have a couple of different methods that I use, and there are pros and cons to each. Method one is simply splitting the culture. I just prepare a second enclosure with half the amount of fresh substrate, hides, and everything that you will need, and then remove half of the isopods and substrate, and, and the hides too, um, from the old enclosure and place them into the new one. You can replenish the material you have removed from the original enclosure with fresh substrate and hides. Done. The greatest advantage to this method is that you don't lose any isopods as long as you haven't had any escapees during the process. When you upgrade to a larger enclosure, the procedure is very similar. When you add substrate and decor to the new larger enclosure, just leave room for the original substrate and the isopods as well. There is a downside to the splitting method though. It won't take all that long before you run out of space. The exclusive use of this technique will result in exponential growth of the number of isopod enclosures that you have. I don't know about you, but I don't have infinite space available. And that brings us to method two. Basically in this method, you remove one third to three quarters of the original substrate and replace it with fresh substrate. And then you take the substrate that you've removed and collect as many isopods as possible to put them back in the original enclosure. And let's face it, this method has its downside. And for the first few minutes, it's fine. If you're working with a thriving isopod colony, the first few minutes, you're just having fun kind of sifting gently through the substrate, finding all these isopods of different sizes. It's, it's actually kind of rewarding. And as you carefully scoop them up and place them back into the original culture, or maybe you have a small collection container with a bit of substrate to keep them from drying out as you're collecting them, and then putting that in the original enclosure, you know, either method works. But as time goes on, fewer and fewer isopods appear. But you suspect, and you're nearly always right, that there are a few left. And as a responsible isopod keeper, you're naturally filled with a desire to save every last one. But the longer you sift through that substrate, the fewer isopods you find. So, what can you do at this point? Well, there are a couple of things you can try to do to collect even more of the remaining isopods. If you keep that substrate in that container and add a small patch of damp moss and a hide and a small amount of food maybe, all in one corner of the enclosure and leave it there for several days and just periodically check in and under that area where there's the hide and the moss and so on, you'll probably be able to find some stragglers. And you can even keep this process going for some time, just adding a moisture and food and, and so on just to that corner and, and the rest of the enclosure will kind of dry out. There won't be anything interesting for the isopods there and they'll tend to migrate to that area. And hopefully you can collect as many isopods as humanly possible over time. At some point though, you're going to need to discard that old spent substrate. The guidelines that I have received from APHIS in conjunction with my isopod permits dictate that the substrate be frozen for 72 hours before disposal. So that's what I do. And my wife has actually kindly suggested that we get an Aquarimax freezer someday, which sounds good to me. I just need a place to put it and the money to pay for it. So there is a third method too, and that's replacing all of the substrate. But I only recommend this method if there's something really wrong with the existing substrate. For example, Let's imagine a young child with the purest of intentions is helping you care for the isopods and dumps a quart of water into a six quart tub all over the substrate. 
that would be one good reason to replace it all. In general though, seeding the new substrate with a portion of the old substrate is extremely helpful. It will generally and hopefully contain springtails as well as beneficial bacteria and other microorganisms that will help establish a healthy ecosystem in the new enclosure. So if possible, preserve some of the original substrate when you replace it, as I suggested in method two. The final step I take when changing the substrate is to add a label to the outside of the enclosure indicating when I changed the substrate and approximately how much I changed. With over 50 isopod bins, well, there's no way I'm keeping all that in my head. So I hope that this video has answered some of your questions you had on isopod maintenance. If you learned something or you have a tip to share, please let me know in the comments. In an upcoming video in this series, we'll talk about troubleshooting issues with isopods. Thanks for watching today. I post videos every Tuesday and Friday, all on aquarium and vivarium pets, especially isopods. Please feel free to share, rate, comment, and if you haven't already, subscribe. And then click the bell icon so you don't miss my next video.